Hi, I'm Elizabeth Weiss. I'm a retired professor of anthropology from San Jose State University and an NAS board member. My area of expertise is in studying skeletal remains. And since 2020, I have been the uh, subject of multiple cancellation attacks for my research on uh, skeletal remains and for my insistence that collections should be studied and not reburied. Um, I'm here with uh, former uh, Mount Royal University professor. She was there from 2008 to 2020 when she was fired for her satirizing woke ideologies with Dr. Frances Widowson. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for having me on, Elizabeth. So we're going to spend this time to talk about uh, cancel culture, what we have done correctly um, in fighting these attacks on our academic freedom, and maybe what we could have done better. Um, so why don't I start and ask you, um, Francis, um, what was the best decision you think you made once the attacks on your academic freedom started? That's a good question. I, I think one of the best decisions that I made was one of my colleagues, a very astute person, noticed that I was getting involved in more and more controversies at the university. And I remember distinctly him saying to me, if you are going to be continuing in discussing these ideas, what you should do is you should make sure that you record everything that you do. You should, uh, for all your public talks, you should uh, have a recorder. You should go buy a recorder and record things for everything that is done, any meetings that you have that uh, are not uh, considered to be confidential. You should, and especially those ones, if, if there's going to be any disciplinary action that is going to be mounted against you, you should have a recording of that. And I was very um, skeptical of this. I thought it was a bit, uh, there was an exaggeration of the threats uh, that I would be facing. But I did follow his advice. And I remember specifically, because it was in September uh, 2019, I was going to a talk that was going to be given at the University of Calgary and I went to London Drugs with my husband Albert and we purchased a recorder and I recorded that talk and it was on uh, the incorporation of indigenous star knowledge into the curriculum and I recorded the entire talk and I asked a question at this event and it turned out that this question that I asked, which was asking how should Indigenous star knowledge be incorporated since it is a pre-telescope type of understanding of the stars, should it be an anthropological type of consideration? So you're just looking at how Indigenous people understood the stars, or should it actually be incorporated into the astronomy curriculum? And that was the question. It turned out that that question became the subject of a harassment complaint that was made by Gabrielle Lindstrom uh, in 2020. And the question had been completely um, altered to not be the question that I asked. And if I had not had that recording of that event, I would not have been able to defend myself in the investigation uh, that happened uh, of my questions and how I was interacting in various contexts at Mount Royal University. And uh, at that point, when I got the recorder, I recorded basically any meeting which had, you know, not private conversations, but had, uh, you know, numbers of people involved. And that has been incredibly important uh, in terms of defending myself, but also in terms of uh, having a record of everything that's taken place at Mount Royal University since 2019. Yes, and you know, it's interesting. I, I had a similar situation where when my chair and dean 
um, gave a talk, and it was a Zoom talk about what to do when your tenured colleague is branded a racist. And um, I decided to record that, and it was on Zoom, but I still had a handheld recorder to record it because, of course, I, I wasn't in control of whether I could record it on Zoom, and they weren't recording it. And um, when I told my chair that I that I had attended, I don't think he believed me at first. And then I don't think he believed that it was recorded at first. And then he basically said that it was illegal for me to have recorded it because it, I hadn't made it known that I was recording it. But it was an open Zoom with no password protected. And so in a sense, this is kind of this case where it's not a private conversation. It was a, pub a public thing, even though it was within a specific group. And if they had wanted to keep it private, they would have needed to basically protect it with a password entrance or so. Um, and I can tell you that was one of the one of the very good decisions I made to record that because they tried to basically portray it as they didn't um, say what I was they didn't say all the negative things about me that that they had said, including saying that they were going to um, planning to give me a bad review, perhaps taking me out of the classroom and, and so forth. So absolutely having things on a record is important. And also following up anything that you can't record with an email saying, we, Remember when we talked about this, <laughs> you know? Um, and that was one of the, the pieces of advice I got from Pacific Legal Foundation, that if somebody actually says, don't record this, follow up the conversation with an email. Um, and that way, if they're not denying that that was in the conversation, you have a record of that, of what was said in, in a, not a, you know, concrete way as a recording, but still a record of what was said. And that's, that's, that's very, very true. And as well, uh, for people who are involved in areas uh, where you suspect that there is opposition to you, you need to start to organize your documents. Uh, so when I began to think that I was going to be pushed out of Mount Royal University, I got another computer, not my work computer. That's very, very important. If you have conversations uh, that you want to make sure that you can speak candidly with other people and you're, you're nervous about, uh, you, for example, your employer having records of these conversations, um, have that all protected on your own computer. And when you save your files, you save them with a date stamp on those files so that they can be organized on your computer. And I know this sounds as if it is too extreme, but if you don't have records, this is so important. If you don't have records, you will have no ability to contest what is being said about you. And, and this is, it's happened time and time again. I've known colleagues who were not prepared for these circumstances and people just made up things about them. And as a result of that, they suffered all sorts of uh, consequences, which should never have happened. And it's terrible that we've come to this, but this is the kinds of, these are the kinds of things that happen in, in these environments. Yes, correct. Um, you know, beyond just recording, I think that another thing that, I felt I had done very well when I was being um, when I was under attack for the various um, different aspects of my research, whether it was for uh, my book Repatriation and Erasing the Past, or whether it was when I spoke up against um, citational um, um, bias. So when we were prompted to um, by a colleague to use cite black authors as a database in order to ensure that you cite black authors. Um, one of the things that I felt was very important and very helpful to my case was always being open and honest and also connecting with people who were willing to publish on these issues. So the college fix, for example, 
I you know, covered many of the little uh, nuances of my cancellation attacks um, against me. Um, I know they did one on the site Black Authors. They also did an article when my university decided to uh, insert a menstrual, um, menstrual taboo in order to handle skeletal remains. Um, and they just, you know, every time something arose, I contacted the journalist and I was like, this is, this just came up because that again is a record. And it also, you know, shows some of the absurdity of what you're going through um, and makes uh, people aware of the situation in universities. Sometimes they might think, oh no, there's no way that this is going on at, at some of our finest institutions. And um, yet, you know, uh, there's all sorts of shenanigans going on from, you know, basically uh, menstrual taboos to, you know, trying to insert indigenous knowledge into astronomy to saying that, you know, by binary sex doesn't exist and that you can't tell the difference between a man and a woman. And we need to speak out against this and we need people to cover it. And interestingly, like, it, these are all intertwined issues. So I had never thought about some of these things because I was so focused on the importance of the study of skeletal remains. And yet it got embroiled into all the other woke issues. And I think that's because it is like this one big web. Yes. And so the, the menstrual taboos that you were mentioning, I think people might find that hard to believe. That that's the case. Uh, I have seen it myself in handbooks on uh, including indigenous perspectives and so on into university uh, ceremonial activities. I just was wondering specifically how have you encountered this menstrual taboo uh, idea in archaeology? So basically when I wrote Repatriation and Erasing the Past, I noticed that in order to collaborate with some tribes, field schools, such as those coming out of UC Berkeley, you know, probably one of the birthplaces of feminism, um, have inserted menstrual taboos in their archeological field schools to the extent of if a student was um, menstruating, they could not engage in field activities and they could, they the dishes that they ate off had to be washed separately, just absurdity. And I had written about this menstrual taboo, but I had never personally experienced it at my university. And I had obviously never um, pushed for anything like that with, um, with our collections. But once my book came out and there was all these attacks on it, and once um, I was being um, targeted for my, you know, pro-science, pro-reburial positions, my university decided to rewrite the protocols to gain access to the skeletal collections that I had curated for something like 17 years. And one of the first things that they did was they inserted a menstrual taboo in order to gain access to the collections. If a and they couldn't even bring themselves to say menstruating women. They said menstruating personnel. Because we all know that men <laughs> menstruate too. <laughs> um, but so they basically put that in as actually the third point of their new protocols. That if you are a menstruating personnel, you are not to be um, allowed in the curation facilities and, and cannot... So not only can you not handle skeletal remains, you are not even allowed in the room. Um, and I pointed this out to my lawyers at the Pacific Legal Foundation, and we immediately told the university that we would be filing a Title IX suit if that was not removed. And it was removed. The NAGPRA coordinator actually had to write a letter to the courts saying that nobody had been negatively affected by this. Um, and had deleted it. And if you look, even if you look at the protocols now at San Jose State, it goes one, whatever it is, two, and then four. And there's just a black line where menstru the menstrual taboo once was. 
So it is a, and it's crazy. I know. I know. And it's just the general anti-scientific types of developments that have happened in many, many disciplines, archaeology being the most surprising because I always saw archaeology as the, in, in, with respect to the social sciences and humanities, being the sort of materialist scientific foundation for many of the d disciplines such as especially anthropology. And I know anthropology has had serious uh, you know, deterioration over time, has had a serious deterioration, but archaeology, to see archaeology uh, yeah. sort of pandering to such, such unscientific ideas is, yeah. is, is shocking. It is quite shocking. And what's interesting, too, is that, you know, you have the four fields of anthropology, cultural or sociocultural, and then, uh, which is always considered the least scientific and probably the most woke, then archaeology, um, physical anthropology, which kind of overlaps with archaeology sometimes and when um, you look at skeletal remains in the bio in the archaeological record, excuse me, and then uh, linguistics, and I think that many people view archaeology and physical anthropology or biological anthropology as the scientific arms of anthropology, and, mm -hmm. and they should be yes. so, but they have gone even woker than linguistics and um, cultural anthropology in some ways. And the American Association of Biological Anthropology put out a statement of um, there's a, a statement about the trans issue mm. um, that is a, I think it's something like there's no place for transphobia here, mm. trans hate mm. here, mm. and they're arguing that sex and not just gender but sex is on a spectrum and. Um, it's one of the least scientific statements I've read and one of the most political. And it, they basically put that out right after um, my own talk at the American Anthropological Association was canceled. And that talk was about uh, sex in skeletal remains. Yes. Um, uh, I think the title was something like um, Make No Bones About It, Sex in the Skeleton is Binary. Mm. Um, and so I think that we we had this kind of belief that physical anthropology would be okay even if cultural anthropology became woke. And it's actually turned out the opposite and same with archaeology. Mm. Um, part of it is we get all these people who are not interested in the past, studying the past. They're really interested in inserting their own or their own politics, their own tribal identity into the past and therefore you get things like queer anthropology and queer archaeology movement, um, which really ruins the field. That's, that's correct. So in terms of your own cancellations and problems that you've had, is there something that you think that you've done particularly well in fighting against attempts to cancel you and push you out of archaeology? I think that what I've done particularly well is I've just been very vocal and and write as much as possible. Um, that, you know, that's what I did very well. I also immediately got legal help mm. um, from Pacific Legal Foundation. I will be ever grateful for their help. Um, and I think that that, that was important. Um, I was very fortunate to have some um, people who came and stepped up to the plate to give affidavits for my case. So all of those things were quite, quite good. Ironically, one of the first things I did, which increased my profile, and some people were like, oh, this is a terrible thing you did, um, was the tweet of me holding a skull. Um, what I sometimes refer to as skull gate. And I, you know, this was after months of being away from the collection um, because of COVID restrictions. I get back into the curation facility. I'm putting remains, um, organizing the remains, putting them in the right back, um, the correct boxes, bags, rebagging certain ones. And I see this beautiful skull of a child. Um, and it just filled my heart with joy to see it. I mean, like, 
I was just so happy to be back in the room with this collection and and happy to be doing my job. And so I took a snapshot. It's not even a like it's not a professional photograph. It's just a snapshot of me. And I took a snapshot and I said, um, so happy to be back with old friends. And I posted this on Twitter. I was fairly new to Twitter. And I had joined Twitter because there were so many people writing uh, nasty stuff about me that I had to go on. Um, they were attacking my book and so forth. And I felt like I need to see what's going on. And without being on Twitter, I really couldn't follow it. And I thought, um, I'm going to join Twitter. And that was one of my early tweets. It came right after I did an op-ed that was on the new native, uh, the new California reburial laws, CalNAGPRA. And um, the, it just kind of exploded the case. Um, and uh, a lot of people were very upset about the op-ed. And actually that got many more comments than the, the um, Skullgate photo. But it was a Skullgate photo that people think of because it is such a uh, visually catching photo in the sense of uh, anyone who sees that, who is, you know, looking at, at, at it objectively can see that this is a photo of joy. Yes. Um, of, you know, I do have a genuine smile on that photo. Um, but uh, it brought my case and my position of the importance of skeletal remains to the forefront. And so I think that that was a really important thing for me to do, even though when I did it, that's not why I was doing it. <laughs> yes. It's just so. Yes, no, it's kind of surprising that people think that professors can't have multiple ways of approaching issues. Yeah. And that's been something that's been a real problem for me because I think that satire, the form of satire is incredibly important or pursuing certain ideas. And what I've discovered is that in the current climate uh, that exists, if you try to use satire or various kinds of literary techniques to expose the absurdity of what's happening, you can be seriously punished for that. And I think maintaining a sense of humor, because that's what I sort of saw your tweet as is that it, it was sort of bringing a bit of humor humor and joy yeah absolutely to your situation and, and i like to th maybe i'm not but i like to think my, of myself as a funny person um and you know I, throughout my years at san jose state we were encouraged to publicize and bring to the public our love of our field Mm -hmm. The number of times the university asked me to pose with skeletal remains and use those photos in promotional materials was, you know, I can't even count. And yet, um, when I did it I, in this ad hoc way, it was like, that was, that was now I was evil, you know. Um, but, you know, another aspect of it is, you know, we... Satire, you know, one of my favorite books that I used to use in my classes was a, a book on modern mummies. And um, I, the course was on mummies. Um, and the author, Quigley, Christine Quigley, she had such a funny sense of humor throughout the book. And satiring certain aspects, but also just telling certain jokes about it. And this... It seems to be lost like in a sense you have to treat a skeletal collection as a funeral and it's not a funeral mm. it's a skeletal collection it's very different if somebody is literally grieving mm -hmm. at a funeral than if somebody is using um using skeletal collection for research regardless of the ethnicity of those people who were uh, who are being researched um, you know, that's a very different scene. You know, it's it's just, um, you know, not the same thing as if you would, you know, if I would go to a funeral, of course I would be, you know, well, I'm not going to make, it, try to make the people there uh, laugh with the, or, you know, smile. So I would respect their silence or their thing. But this is not a funeral. This was mm -hmm. a curation facility with ancient remains 
that are been used for decades to help understand the past. And, in, and on a serious note, to give an accurate reconstruction of the past and to teach students of the, um, who are going into things like forensics correct techniques to be able to help people in the present. And you need a bit of distance and you need from it. the actual imaginings of who these particular people are. And I know this is a big problem in trying to include indigenous people in scientifically studying the past. And I've heard uh, accounts of indigenous people and archaeology in what used to be the Soviet Union when there's not the same kind of uh, sort of spiritual beliefs and so on that are deployed with respect to preventing people from understanding skeletal remains and the role that they play in understanding the past. And in fact, indigenous people in what was the Soviet Union are very happy to have archaeology archaeologists come and study those remains because they think that that will enable everyone to develop a better understanding of what happens historically, and they see themselves as being part of developing that better understanding. Yeah, and hopefully that will stay that way. And we, we're starting to see this kind of repatriation and reburial ideology um, spread throughout um, throughout Europe. Uh, just the other day, 4,000 year old remains from Berlin were reburied. Mm. Um, and my mother, who is German, she was like, that's not very German of them. <laughs> So, you know, who we will see. On the flip side, what do you think you could have done better? I think uh, just uh, considering everything that's happened uh, in the past, I've tried as much as I can to keep things on the level of ideas and not to focus on the personalities of people uh, that are involved. However, sometimes if someone's attacking you personally, it, I think it's, it's, it's often necessary to expose the hypocrisy that you see. So, for example, one of the people who uh, filed a complaint against me, she was attacking me, and while she was trying to mobilize an anonymous with a group that was uh, claimed to be a student group uh, to try to get me fired, she had on her social media profile that she was a loving and kind person just <laughs> trying to bring people together with humility and grace. And so I pointed out in my uh, satire of her activities, whenever I referred to her, I would refer to her as a loving and kind person who was just trying to bring people together with humility and grace. So I think that was completely justified in doing that. But there was, uh, uh, there have been some circumstances where I was just kind of annoyed and it concerned the trans activism issue, which you are involved with. Um, and it's largely about the pronouns where people, it's a, it's a very delicate balancing act because on the one hand, you're advertising your pronouns but on the other hand, you're not supposed to comment on people advertising their pronouns. And in this case, this person was a non-binary individual who uh, wanted to be referred to uh, with they, them pronouns. And when there was some kind of commentary going on on social media about this, I uh, someone was casted, castigating the, the journalist Jonathan Kay for referring to this faculty member as having they that he referred to them as they them because of their pronouns and I said um, that I didn't know why people were castigating Jonathan Kate for referring to this person with uh, uh, this colleague as having they them pronouns because this this colleague had a cartoon in one of their pronouns workshops which was talking about this phenomenon of misgendering fatigue and this was a, a very funny cartoon. It wasn't intended to be funny, but it was very funny because it had a person who said that being misgendered 
was like having a brick put into your backpack every time you were misgendered. So at the end of the day, it was like you had a backpack full of bricks and you had to lie down and you couldn't get up because your, your backpack was so full of bricks. So I thought this cartoon was really, really funny. And I satirized this cartoon. And in satirizing this cartoon, I said, um, I didn't know why people were castigating Jonathan Kay for mentioning the they, them pronouns because it appeared that this colleague, this MRU colleague, was suffering from, or hinted at being at suffering from misgendering fatigue. Anyway, in hindsight, I think that was a that was a mistake. And I really wish that I had kept that at the level of just an abstract discussion of misgendering fatigue because this person had never gone after me on social media. So it was sort of seemed to me as, as, a, as a bit of an unfair kind of characterization. And this has been something that I have had to kind of uh, articulate uh, in my arbitration proceedings that if I had to do that all over again, I would have just had an abstract discussion about the situation of misgendering fatigue because I think it's very, very important that if people are not attacking you, uh, it's best not to resort to the personal kind of dynamics. Right. Yeah. But if someone's going to attack you personally and go after you and try to get you fired, I think it's absolutely absurd that people say, that you shouldn't be able to defend yourself. You shouldn't be able to expose the hypocrisy in what people are doing in terms of trying to end your career and to make it impossible for you to discuss ideas in the university. Right, right. And so how about yourself? Do you, do you have things that you regret in terms of uh, your circumstances? I tend to be quite critical of my own performance on almost everything. <laughs> um, and although I do think, you know, I did some things well, um, there are some things that I wish I hadn't done. But I would say that overall, they, they are around me not being aggressive enough. You know, maybe I should have done, you know, a, a different photo every day on Twitter. <laughs> you know? Or, you know, yeah, we had a huge... A huge issue about x-rays um, that I wanted access to this um, and I had asked for um, access to these x-rays and my um, my chair didn't know that they were x-rays of Native Americans and he mistook them as x-rays of Carthaginians from Tunisia which is the other collection we had and I corrected him I said no they are Native American and so those x-rays quickly turned it into sacred x-rays as soon as it was made known that they were Native American and I didn't get access to them. So I do think that, you know, um, I, you know, maybe it wasn't a mistake, but I do feel like I could have been gone harder. <laughs> and um, I, I tend to be a, quite a civil person. Um, and so I don't think that um, I even would would have thought that other people weren't going to be as civil um you know and so it kind of surprised me when some of my colleagues who i had been very nice to throughout my career even at even right towards the end had turned out to be quite nasty individuals um and so i think Maybe I shouldn't have taken the high road so many times. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a hard thing to know. It's, it's a hard, hard thing. To it's know. hard thing to balance. Yes. Because I think definitely one should not pull one's punches. Like if you are being attacked, then trying to figure out ways to expose the um, double standards. And that's really right. sort of the really infuriating thing about it is right. that you have people who are just being the most unbelievable, nasty people you can imagine. They act the way that they do. And then you have someone like yourself who, you know, you have one tweet where you're showing a bit of humor and, and joy about being back with your, your data and your the yeah. materials that you're studying. And now this is just, you know, beyond the pale and 
you should be castigated for this and so on. Yeah, and it's kind of, the other thing is that in a sense, um, I, in one sense, um, I don't think that you can change your personality. You know, I, I just think that how I reacted a lot of times is how I react. And part of this is because it, even though, you know, they did very nasty things to me, like, you know, calling me a racist, a, a eugenicist, a Nazi, a white supremacist, saying that they were going to take me out of my classrooms. And these are like my deans and chair, um, saying, trying to find out ways so that I will never have access to skeletal remains again. I, I don't let things bother me very much. Mm. And so when things like this were happening, you know, people would be like, are you okay? I'm like, yes, I'm okay. And, and in my book uh, on the war path, my battles with Indians, pretendians and woke warriors, I have a line in there that throughout all these ordeals, I laughed, I cried more tears of laughter than tears of sadness. And that is true. I, there were times when people, yes, it was mean or nasty of people, but sometimes it just so absurd you just have to laugh at it yes and that was my take on a lot of this regardless mm. of where it was going i was like i just cannot let this ruin my life mm. and so um i kind of you know laughed at a lot of it even the very serious things mm. so yes so in terms of your own case many would see it as um, a symptom of a much larger problem, which is the, ter the deterioration of academic freedom uh, that's happened uh, in universities. Do you, how have you seen that as happening with respect to your case? Um, I do, initially I didn't see all the interconnections. I knew that the university had gone woke. I knew a lot of the problems in the university but I didn't see all the interconnections. Once repatriation and erasing the past came out and it was, there was the concerted effort by almost a thousand people who signed the open letter to try to get that book pulled, I started seeing connections much more. And some of that is, as I said, like the site black authors, others is, the, other examples are the poverty narrative where students you know, are taught you know, that, the, oh, they're all really poor, even when they're not. Um, and um, then, you know, certain child uh, emphasis on treating adults like children. So I think that a lot of this uh, revolves around a couple big themes. One is identity politics. So you'll have throughout the university various identity politics. One, of course, is a Native American identity, which plays a role in my case, but then there's the queer identity and there's a Hispanic identity. And so all these different identity politics plays a role where what's important is who, um, who is telling the story and whether they are one of the um, oppressed minorities, one of the identities that have been oppressed and not whether what they're saying is actually true. And this I think is throughout academia. And I think it's a, it comes out of postmodern ideology mm. um, where you have kind of a concept of there is no truth or, or fact versus fiction, but rather it's on a spectrum like sex is. <laughs> um, and, um, and that who is telling the story is the important thing and not whether it's true or not. Um, and so I do think that that's how a lot of this is interwoven. Yes, identity politics. Do you think that identity politics is postmodern? Or I, is it, is, how are those two things connected, identity politics and postmodernism, which I understand to be the subjective, the, the prizing of right. the subjective over the objective. So it's all about what a subjective belief is about that's what's got to be accepted as being, uh, or at least we have to pretend to accept it as being true, as opposed to trying to reach some kind of common understanding, right. which we can disagree about, and we can sort of deploy evidence to try to understand that. 
that seems to me to be the postmodern position. But then we have identity politics, which seems to be another matter. I don't know if that can be I seen think they in that are, way. Or not. I do think that they are combined because I think that because postmodernism doesn't have an objective truth, the truth, the the tale lies in who's telling the story. Yes. And so in anthropology, that has oftentimes been the other or yeah. the non-Western. And so yeah. I see it uh, intertwined in that way. Yeah. So, and the other aspect of this is that we have kind of, um, in, in addition to the postmodernism, is we have this harm avoidance. Mm. And that goes to that second theme of, you know, treating adults like children. Mm. So, you know, I do think that, you know, you can, people can be hurt by, by words. They can feel hurt. But words are not violence. Yeah. <laughs> and they've kind of elevated that, you know, words can be hurtful to words are literal violence. And that is another aspect of it. Mm. Uh, I think that they also, there's also a turn to make everything about race. Mm. Um, and so one of the things I was surprised about was that I was... Th that. Um, the book, Repatriation and Erasing the Past, was called out as being racist. Mm. We don't really even talk about race. I mean, so it's, a, it's about reburial and repatriation laws and, and about um, postmodernism, mm. but we didn't really talk about race in that book, and so it was surprising. Mm. But they turn the postmodern academics, especially in anthropology, have turned everything into race. Yes. And did they actually specify why? they thought that that book was racist? Um, some people commented, ironically, on a footnote where we actually say, um, Jim Springer, who is my co-author, did, did that aspect of the book, but said, you know, sometimes we'll be using the term race because that is the term used in the law. Mm. And we have this footnote that explains that. And then even goes on to say, but we understand that race is a complicated term. And, you know, yeah. <laughs> so, but, so some people picked up on that footnote and said that that footnote shows we were racist, which is kind of ironic because uh, one thing is just a footnote, but the other thing is that it, it, it was our acknowledgement of the problem of the term race. I really don't think that ra the term race is a problem. Um, but um, I know a lot of people do. I do, I do think that there are biological races, just like there are biological sex differences. Um, but none of that was really captured in the book because it wasn't about the topic. Mm. Um, now, some people might have um, picked, you know, might have called me out for being a racist based on other factors, mm. such as my. Um, first husband having been Phil Rushton, who did race research. Mm -hmm. But I don't think that was known at the beginning. I think that that was um, found out later on. Yes. Which is kind of interesting. And I had never hidden it. I never hit, hit it at all. But it just never became an issue because by the time, mm. you know, this came out, I, you know, I can't remember exactly when, but... Um, Phil passed away, I believe, in 2012, mm. and he and I split up, I believe, in 2004. Mm. So it's, you know, yeah. a lot of time had passed. Yes, because so. I've heard um, uh, people, because I've been called a racist as well, and I don't talk about race at all myself. I talk about culture and learned behavior, which can be changed and you can have an indigenous person who is completely modern in terms of their understandings of things, and then you can have uh, a non-indigenous person who is very, very traditional and harbored in, um, you know, superstitions and so on that might exist. So it doesn't really have anything to do with race. It has to do with the kinds of educational processes that you've been uh, exposed to. But I've heard people say things like, if you deny a survivor's account of the residential schools, that's racist. And I don't, I, I've never been able to figure out 
why they think that that's racist, even if you should not be denying right. the memories of a person who went to the uh, residential schools, it's not clear how that would make you someone who believed that a group of people was inferior because of their race and should be deprived of rights on that basis and was somehow outside of society just because you happen to disagree with their account of something that happened in the past. So it's never really been clearly specified when I'm having these yeah. discussions, but it is stated. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts about why that is, is it just a tactic that I people are trying to top you, stop you from discussing things? Or is it sort of a, a position that indigenous people should just be believed and if you don't believe them, obviously it's because you harbor some kind of prejudice against them. I think it's a, probably a combination. I do think that some people think they should just be believed and everything they say is true and, um, you know, that kind of argument. And if you don't believe them then, and, and you are not indigenous, then you are racist. <laughs> um, but I think the other thing is it's kind of a tactic too. I think that once you throw in somebody's racist or, or a Nazi or an anthropology, a eugenicist, the, really the argument is kind of over. Mm. You know, mm. where do you go from that besides trying to deny it? Mm. And that's not the argument. Um, you know, that, you know, when you're trying to deal with the specifics of, for example, the residential schools, you know, when you're trying to deal with our are there children who were murdered mm. or not? Mm -hmm. You know, you throw in a word racist and the argument is over because now there's another, there's another thing that you're arguing or trying to fight against. Like, well, I'm not a racist. You know? mm. So I do think it's a tactic to kind of um, derail the, um, the conversation. You know? So... And I try not to let it derail conversations but, or debates, but I think that that is a tactic. Definitely, yeah. So in terms of identity politics, we've discussed that in terms of being a major kind of deterioration of academic freedom. Is there some reason why identity politics has become so much more dominant in universities? I'm not sure. I, I, I wouldn't... I would say it's hard to say for me what the actual trigger point mm -hmm. is, mm. but I do think that it stems from postmodernism. But I'm not sure how, yeah. you know, I know, I, I think that throughout my career at San Jose State, you noticed a real uptick in it in like around 2015. Mm. So yes. um, that was when I started seeing this uptick and whether that is um, when we get more social media or when we get um, the trans movement taking hold. I'm not 100% sure. What are your thoughts on that? I think that it is definitely related to the knocking out of the pursuit of truth that happened in the 1960s that created the fertile soil uh, for identity politics to gain a foothold in the university. And then once it gained a foothold in the university because we didn't have really the academic protections of trying to say, look, although you might have your political views, really the academic environment is about evidence-based arguments and you can't just use these, you know, kind of references to identity to be able to make your position dominate over everyone else's position, uh, which I think uh, is what happens with respect to identity politics. I think there's a lot of complex social forces at work as to why it's not just universities, but it's just throughout the entire society that this is that this is occurring. And I think within the university system, it has to do with the corporatization of the university and the fact that um, universities are now largely businesses that are selling products, and so they become very, very concerned about um, whether their brand is being negatively impacted and, and often the brand is about inclusion and diversity and equity and these sorts of things. 
Um, but I think generally there has been a, a sort of a move away from class politics in the wider uh, economic system towards um, diversity, inclusion, and equity, and gender, race, sexual orientation, these issues. And so I think a preoccupation with these types of subjective identities in the wider society as opposed to class politics, I think that that has kind of a complex interaction yeah. with what's happening in universities. I also wonder how much of it is just the growth of universities mm. to people into people's um, or into society where we are having people who are not really intellectuals come to universities and then they're like, why am I not doing well in physics? Mm. Oh, it's because I'm a woman. <laughs> yes. So it's a good reason, to uh, a good way to kind of excuse failure. Mm. Um, and so I do think that that is also a part of it. So a lowering or dumbing down of curriculum mm. in some fields and then still having other fields that are more difficult and that, that then leads to these... Um, unequal outcomes and people are feeling well it's it can't be my fault i've been told all my life that i can i can be whoever i want to be yes. i can do whatever i want to be and they're looking for an, uh, an excuse and part of that excuse is they're I, they're um being uh treated uh poorly because of their race or their sex or yes. so forth so in terms of trying to combat some of these problems that we're seeing in universities. Do you think that there is something that would really assist us in trying to stop the deterioration of academic freedom in universities? Uh, I return, <laughs> I return to some more uh, rigorous standards and appreciation that universities can shrink by removing um, unintellectual endeavors certain uh, fields. Um, I, I could list many of them. <laughs> um, the whole ethnic studies um, uh, you know, universe. Um, that I think that that would help a lot because once you reintroduce rigor, you're going to get better students, better professors, and I think those people will be more interesting interested in answering the important questions mm. or the interesting questions like what were those people 5,000 years ago doing um, in the Bay Area of California or you know uh, how do we tell if somebody um, was uh, you know capable of language or not if you're looking at for example Neanderthal remains and so when you get People who are intellectuals, you will re, you will again turn to intellectual questions, and those people will hopefully attract students with the same mindset of curiosity, and hopefully that would bring the university back to where it should be. Yes, I think. Uh, do you have anything else to add? I think that there is also, besides the, um, the restoring the intellectual character of the university, I think that there are changes in governance of institutions that could be very helpful. And what we have, and I'm not sure what the position in the United States is, but I think it's similar to Canada, we have boards of governors that are appointed by the government, and we have a whole huge array of professional administrators now mm -hmm. that are in place. And there's been a huge growth in administration in universities. And historically, models of, uni models of universities were not like that. They were that the faculty would elect the administrators, the administrators would be exceptional academics. They would spend a number of years in administration, not because they loved the task, but they thought it was their duty mm -hmm. to maintain the integrity of the institution. And when they were finished, they would go back into the uh, faculty 
and be, and return to being a, a researcher and a teacher and so on. So there are models of universities which do this, whereby you have the faculty that elect administrators, and that has pretty much been erased in the United States and Canada. So restoring that kind of model of governance of the institution, I think, would combat some of the tendencies towards corporatization that right. we're seeing in universities. Yeah, that's a good point. And administrators, especially some of the upper administrators, they're really not intellectuals, um, and they don't have the, that kind of intellectual curiosity that um, should be um, intrinsically linked to academia. Thank you so much for, um, for coming to New York <laughs> um, and for having this conversation with me. Um, and what is next for you? Um, well, I'm hoping to pursue my case. So my case is currently in arbitration. Decision was reached in uh, July, uh, but it's being appealed, the decision. And so I am hoping to document everything that's happened to try to explain how the case of Mount Royal University, although it is one institution, because it's so well, document, well documented over a period of probably a decade, it can be a lesson to others as to how uh, incredibly vibrant and academically concerned institution can be completely destroyed uh, in this period of time. Yeah, well, we're, we will definitely look forward to reading more about that.